Funding for the Pause for Pride series in this production of Folks was provided by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Coming up on Folks, history professor Ruby Sims shares her fascinating research about the first black families in Baton Rouge, how they helped to build a university and a thriving township on today's Pause for Pride. Then, a one-on-one -on -one interview with Clarence Smith, the man who made Essence magazine a success. Finally, an event for black business people in Baton Rouge that mixes business with pleasure. All on today's edition of Folks. Everyone and welcome to Folks. I'm Sonia Massengale. Today we conclude our exclusive Black History Month series, Pause for Pride, with a look at how the area surrounding Southern University's campus on the north side of Baton Rouge grew along with the university. Research compiled by Dr. Ruby Sims, a professor of history at Southern University, tells us that the township of Scotlandville that grew around the university was no accident. She calls the early residents of that area first black families. Since Sims herself is part of one of those families, we find that she has made her work as a historian a labor of love. The campus of Southern University in Baton Rouge sits on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. The area surrounding the campus is known as Scotlandville. It is one of the earlier black townships of South Louisiana and the subject of Dr. Ruby Sims' historical research. It is where she grew up, went to school, and began her career. Having grown up in the area, I could remember when uh, uh, Scotlandville Avenue, uh, which is Highway 19, was not paid. And when I would tell the students about uh, remembering, I call them cowboys, men riding through on horsebacks uh, uh, from Baker and from Slaughter, uh, driving the cows down Scotland Avenue to the slaughter pen, they would say, well, how old are you? But uh, even as a kid, I could, I could remember things like that. And I would tell them things about the, the last days of World War II. And they want to know, well, when were you born, if you remember all of that kind of stuff? But I think that interest really stemmed from, uh, primarily from my mother, who would talk about those families. And whenever somebody uh, died and she attended the funeral, she would always bring the program back. And eventually we would throw, throw away some of those programs. And then I started saving them because that was part of the history too, particularly if it was an older person. Uh, and she would tell us other things that should have been included in the obituary that she thought, and then I would uh, preserve those programs. Uh, then I joined the faculty at Southern University. One of the early settlers of Scotlandville is Amanda Kelly Mackey. A businesswoman, Mackey owned a grocery store and a bus company. My first remembrance of uh, Mrs. Amanda Kelly, she was a Kelly then, and later married uh, Mr. Mackey after her husband uh, passed was the, the beautiful brick home that uh, she and Art, Mr. Artier built, uh, which was facing the street which I uh, lived on, where I was born, Stilt Street. Amanda Kelly Mackey uh, lived in this large, beautiful red brick home. And I think uh, about a year after they built a home, Mr. Artier died. But I don't remember the bus company, the buses per se. But as I said, my mother would tell me about this. But I do remember her store. Uh, Mrs. Amanda Kelly Mackey had the distinction of being the first black businesswoman of Scotlandville. She and her husband, Artiel, operated a grocery store. And later, they provided bus transportation for the faculty members and students of Southern University. Uh, naturally, we didn't have any city buses coming into the area at that time, and they had primarily used wagons and used horses to get to downtown Baton Rouge. Uh, the late Felton G. Clark, in an interview in 1969, I think it was, 
toll of having to ride to Baton Rouge on that flatback wagon and how many hours it would take uh, to get just to the Standard Oil plant where they would stop and the driver would then have to let the horses rest and give them water and then they would journey on. So we can get downtown, let's say 12, 13, 14 minutes. Uh, it took hours and, and when he mentioned New Orleans, you know, that's sort of like going to Europe. The building of Scotlandville is directly related to the growth and development of Southern University. Sims once interviewed Felton G. Clark, son of the founder of Southern University, about the early days of the Scotlandville area. It's, it's like one big community, I guess I could say. When the late Joseph Samuel Clark, the first president of Southern, was given the charge to find a place to move the fixtures and to find the faculty and to get the student body, uh, he had to branch out on his own and find these people. And so the story goes uh, from this interview with the son that they came to this area, they, they found this area and they decided on this area and the university opened, it was moved from New Orleans, it had been uh, formed in 1880 in New Orleans. He moved it uh, to Scotts Bluff, to this area in 1914, and they opened uh, on March 9th, 1914. And at that time, he had uh, less than 10 faculty members, I guess less than 50 students. But among those faculty members were uh, James Blaine Moore, uh, E.N. Mayberry, and Dr. Joseph Samuel Clark's wife, Octavia Head Clark. To understand how all of these people are interwoven and there's a certain, uh, well, that connective link is there with Southern, we would have to go back to, uh, first of all, Joseph Samuel Clark having contact with Booker T. Washington. Uh, they were good friends and he said, I need faculty members. And it was Booker T. who told him to seek James Blaine Moore, who was over at Prairie View. Once he secured the site, and once the school opened, he went back. This is this uh, biography written by John Brother Cade. He went back to North Louisiana, and that's why you're going to, if you do any research on Southern, you're going to find a lot of the faculty members and a lot of the first students came out of North Louisiana, Monroe, Louisiana in particular. Annie B. Knox is a lifetime uh, resident. She was not born in Scotlandville, but moved here many, many years ago. And uh, let me go back to perhaps part of my beginnings. There was an elementary school, South Scotlandville Elementary School, which divided my home from Mrs. Knox home. And even though Mrs. Knox came into the area and one, was one of Southern's first graduates, I think she graduated from Southern in 1922-23, that year, uh, later went on to other universities. Mrs. Knox became one of our leading principals, educators and principals in the area. I think the last school where she was principal was Zion City Elementary. And after she retired, she remained very active in the education field, but she traveled widely, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, and everywhere she went, she would bring back uh, souvenirs and bring back uh, uh, products from those countries and then share them with us and with various groups. So Ms. Knox was, uh, she's still living, uh, was very much in demand as a speaker. She's received numerous uh, awards and uh, certificates and in 1983 she was one of 26 ladies that the YWCA highlighted as uh, one of the, its women of achievements. Ms. Knox was highlighted uh, for her contributions to education, for her fight uh, not only in education but uh, in other areas as well. Sims is working to preserve the history of Scotlandville and Southern University. In the name of progress, many of the older buildings on Southern's campus have been destroyed. While I was walking to get my mail one day, the bulldozers had arrived and I perhaps saw the first impact or the first stroke which knocked down a part of Southern High. I stood there and I cried. Uh, 
that historic building was destroyed. And I think a whole lot of persons uh, were touched by it. Uh, I wish that we could have moved it brick by brick. I don't know what was the rationale, but to have lost buildings like that, which are uh, buildings that meant so much to so many people, uh, many of those children who were members of the first family uh, attended Southern High and graduated from the uh, laboratory school. Dr. Sims teaches her students that history is what gives you a legacy to hold on to as well as a vision for the future. I think one key legacy, one part of it, would be strength. There is something, and there should be, in each person's history that will give them that strength, give them that drive to continue to move on, to fight for a cause, uh, to know that persons who were before them made great sacrifices, to, to, to honor those persons, to have the respect for all that they did, and to, to keep alive the dream. I think that is perhaps the most important thing. Uh, if you do not know your history, how can you ever hope to have uh, a very good future? Sims' family was also what she calls one of the first black families of Baton Rouge. They are bound to Southern University with ties that date back to the founding of the school. Although Southern is now experiencing some dramatic transitions, she believes that these sons and daughters of the university will see it through the hard times. I think... The university will survive. I think presently we are under very, very strong leadership. Uh, there are good things that have occurred since the administration. There are even greater things that will, or will occur. That love for Southern, Dr. Spikes has it. That love for Southern, Dr. Sims has it. That love for Southern, millions of other people have it. And, uh, we are all fighting, we're all going to work together to continue its existence. More information about Southern University can be found by contacting the Southern University Library in Baton Rouge. There are a few people in the black community who are unfamiliar with Essence Magazine, a unique publication designed for today's black woman and founded nearly 20 years ago. But Essence is more than just a magazine. Essence Communications Incorporated has grown in leaps and bounds. Clarence Smith, president of Essence Communications, Inc., was in New Orleans recently, and he shared with us his visions for Essence for the future. When you think of Essence, the magazine usually comes to mind. But Essence Communications is actually a multifaceted corporation worth millions and headed by this man, Clarence O. Smith, founder and president of Essence Communications, Incorporated. Smith says that he and his partners started with a vision almost 20 years ago. I think, I think we decided first that we wanted to publish a magazine. And the idea of publishing a magazine really came about as a result of uh, the experience that we all went through. There were four young men that started that magazine at the time. We were influenced by wanting to do something to extend Dr. King's dream, because when he was killed in April of 1968, we were all what you might call middle management businessmen, young executives and working for major corporations. I happened to be in the investment banking business at the time. Uh, and I think we were all uh, very, very distressed, as were most black Americans, by his death uh, and wondering what could we do to push the idea further, to keep the idea alive in a way that was meaningful and in a way where we had some talent. Uh, and, and since my talent primarily was, was in pursuit of business, I understood business and I just felt that there ought to be something I could do to take his dream, his concept, and in my own talent base, convert my talent base to that, to a resource to help that happen. And I think that the men who joined the business with me, all of whom came from different fields, pretty much felt the same way, that we wanted to just really extend the dream in an area where we felt we had talent. And that's really, that was really the origin of the idea for publishing the magazine, because it would be a, a means of communicating 
positive messages to black people and giving black people a voice. What were some of the problems that you had getting the magazine off the ground? So first, of course, is, is the, the obvious and age-old problem of raising venture capital. I mean, minorities have always had difficulty in raising venture capital uh, for enterprise. Uh, and back in 1969, 1970, I mean, we were really on the cutting edge of what was at that time known as the development of black capitalism. But even, but even though that was becoming an idea that was gaining in popularity at that time, no one was ready yet to lend the kind of money to a black deal that we required to get the essence deal off the ground. Our business plan, for example, called for one and a half million dollars of startup capital. We actually opened the doors and began to develop the magazine as a commercial venture with only $130,000 of that. So in a way, we, got, we kind of got financed just enough to, to fail. Uh, and it really was the tenacity uh, of uh, that founding group, of which I was fortunate enough and privileged to be a part, was really our tenacity uh, and temerity to, to hang in there despite all obstacles and make it work. Finding the common denominators that bound black women together and then being able to publish a magazine that understood those common denominators and translated a point of view that respected those common denominators in the editorial product. That was the hardest thing of all to do. In spite of the problems encountered at the start of the magazine, Smith and his associates did create a successful magazine with a vast readership, including a good portion of male readers. We wanted to, to, to develop a magazine that was primarily aimed at adult black women between 20 and 49, urban-centered, at least some college education. Uh, and that was the target. That was a desirable demographic. And everything that we've ever done really has been a hone in on that woman and make everything in the magazine relevant to her. The fact that so many black men read the magazine is very pleasing to us, however. Uh, but it also speaks to the fact that there are very few good black publications around. And the reason why there are so few is because of the difficulties that I cited in the beginning of getting venture capital together and finding talented uh, people available to do it. Essence Communication has also had a moderate success in the television arena. The television program has halted production temporarily, but will probably be recreated later on. Meanwhile, Essence Communications forges ahead with new ventures. Uh, but for 16 years, uh, the company was just a one-product company. It only had a magazine. Uh, now it is a diversified company that now has a number of other things. As you know, we had a television program that we produced for four years in syndication uh, called Essence. and. Uh, we, we think that uh, there is still a future for us uh, in the development of television product. We certainly think that the home video market offers a tremendous opportunity for us because we have such a strong franchise with black women. So you will be seeing some home video products developed by Essence over the next year or two. Uh, licensing has become a really exciting opportunity for us and we now have uh, not only a line of Essence eyewear uh, we have a line of Essence sewing patterns with the Butterick Company, which is in some 25,000 sewing and fabric centers across the country. We've just signed a deal with a subsidiary of Haynes Hosiery to produce a line of Essence pantyhose, which will be in stores uh, sometime this summer. Uh, and we think good licensing of good quality products that uh, specifically have uh, relevance for black women is a whole direction that we can go. As Essence Communications moves into its 20th year, Smith sees a mission for Essence as well as other black-owned businesses. Well, I think the mission is clear. Uh, the mission is to, uh, first of all, to provide products and information of quality that can help black people to move their lives forward. For the magazine, its mission is to be a source of information an outlet for black attitudes and points of view. It ought to present black talent in all of its forms and variations. Uh, it ought to present 
a political message that is more than just an articulation of a verbal point of view, but it, in its presentation, it should have a political point of view. It should make a statement, in other words, in the quality and excellence of it. Uh, it should encourage uh, black people to pursue fulfillment in the country, uh, and it should and it should address the many of the black concerns that we have: illiteracy, teenage pregnancy, the, the plight of the underclass. All of these are areas that the magazine should deal with, and it should do it in a way that helps people to accept the information, which means that it should not be stilted or pedantic but it should be comfortable for people to read. They should be happy about reading about how to solve problems rather than being preached to. Uh, so it has a very definite place. And every product that we do, that we, that we launch, ought to have as its mission to serve a need, to satisfy a, a need that exists. If we, if we stay close to that kind of integrity, then we can grow and be very successful and feel good about this commercial venture. Um, and if we fail to do that, then we think that the public will begin to reject what we do and uh, we'll lose that credibility and we'll lose the franchise. So I think our mission is very clear. Uh, we ought to be an employer. We ought to provide for those blacks who we ask to go to college and get straight A's and to, and to excel and to do well. We think there ought to be black companies which are able to absorb those talented black people so that blacks can come out of those colleges and at least feel that they have a choice. That they, if they wish to go to work for a general market company, fine. Because we think that, op that, that they ought to. That opportunity should not be constrained or constricted in any way. But if they want to come to work for a black company, they should be able to do that without a sacrifice in their career. That is to say, they should not say, if I go to work for a black company, I will not be able to earn the same money, enjoy the same career growth as I could if I went to work for a white company. And I think that ought to be the mission of black companies, is to be employers that offer the same growth and compensation opportunities within our community as the general market companies do. We've seen today that black businesses can be as rich and diverse as the people who own them. Blacks in business is nothing new, but there are new ways of doing business. Our final feature for today introduces us to New Orleans businessman Noah Hopkins, who is finding ways to make business more of a pleasure through an event he calls First Friday. What you are seeing here is no ordinary party scene. It is the unique innovation of businessman Noah Hopkins of New Orleans who has found a way to mix business with pleasure. First Friday, it came out of a concept that a friend of mine started in Tampa, whereas he had, Tampa was a town that had uh, a lot of black business and professional people, but they had no viable club nightlife, so to speak. So what uh, James, his name is James Brown, and James decided to do was to start giving some quarterly parties, uh, you know, where he'd invite a lot of business and professional people out and use the hotel ballroom and, and try to set it up to look like a club. So, uh, and then after talking with so many people, he, he spoke with a lot of business people and, and seeing some of them meeting each other for the first time, he came up with the concept of putting, uh, making part of it business also. And so it evolved from that into what we're doing right now in Baton Rouge and what he's still doing in Tampa. And uh, I was up at First Friday in Tampa in December, and he had 980 people there for First Friday. And this was coming off of a real huge weekend from another function they had in Tampa, and everyone thought that First Friday would be slow. But he, he said it was still slow to him, 980 people. Generally, he does about uh, 12, 1,300 people. Your business is in New Orleans. Why the interest in Baton Rouge and other areas like Baton Rouge? 
Because First Friday seems to work best in towns of a certain size uh, population. As I mentioned earlier about Tampa, Tampa is, is, is just about the same size with uh, Baton Rouge. Uh, and the economy in New Orleans is really, I mean, on down, uh, trend, downside right now. And, uh, and, and it doesn't seem like 1989 is going to bring us in, any more help because of the fact that, from what I understand, tourism, which is our greatest industry here and the only industry, is going to be down a great deal for 1989. So that's going to hurt somewhat. And so that for, it's for that reason that uh, we moved it to Baton Rouge. We also have uh, Mobile, Alabama on the drawing board and uh, uh, Beaumont, Texas to do. Where are you hoping First Friday will lead? I want it to lead to uh, black folks doing business with black folks. I want, to, I want black people to come out and see the different types of businesses that we have and to see how professionally run these businesses are and to see that they can get the same competitive prices from these businesses. And uh, by the way, the Economic Freedom Association in Baton Rouge, uh, the Mr. Michael Allen is the president of the Economic Freedom Association, has been a tremendous amount of help for me in this. From what I understand, Michael has put uh, the Economic Freedom Association together in such a manner where they are actively practicing spending their dollars with each other. And, you know, it, it's an important thing to do. Hopkins, a former club and restaurant owner, seems to have found a winning combination for black businesses in Baton Rouge. I think it's a great vehicle to uh, exhibit black businesses uh, in the community. Uh, it's a good way of doing business and having pleasure at the same time. Uh, it's worked for us. Last month we had tremendous response. We had uh, quite a few customers to come by our shop. I don't know who came up with never mix business with pleasure in the first place. I think it's a wonderful idea. Hey, let's have fun. Why make it painful? I really do think uh, that it'll help us get business because it brings together people who are interested in helping one another and uh, it, it lets everybody showcase exactly what they have in the city, what a person is offering and uh, that's good because a lot of times when you're in the market to buy a product you don't really know what's out there and when you find a person, especially a black person, who has a business that is uh, competitive, its pricing is good and you like and you need the product then you can have an opportunity to go in there and purchase it. For information pertaining to the next First Friday, please call 504-357-7000 in Baton Rouge or 504-827-5518 in New Orleans. And that's all for this week's program. Be sure to join us for the next edition of Folks. Bye-bye. Funding for the Pause for Pride series in this production of Folks was provided by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities.